Hello, this is Mocha Product Manager Martin Brennan, and welcome to this technology preview of Mocha Pro 2021. We're constantly working on new features inside the software, and today we're going to show you a couple of new ones that are headed for the next major version. Now, be aware this is a technology preview, so there's going to be a couple of rough edges on the features that we show, but we still think you'll be excited by the new tools and what they're going to offer. So let's now dive in to Mocha Pro 2021. Okay, so first up, we're going to talk about a great new feature in the tracking set for Mocha Pro 2021. Now, Mocha is widely known as being a great solution for tracking flat surfaces, such as this ground plane, or things like facial patches, such as the face on this woman here and the chin areas for cleaning up beauty and paintwork and so on. The problem in the past has been, however, while we have a mesh warp insert ability to sort of distort on a plane, we've never been able to work with sort of any movement within that plane to be able to get distortion or non-rigid organic motion. So inside Mocha 2021, we've included a new feature called Power Mesh, and I'm going to load up Mocha inside After Effects here so you can see how that works. So here we are inside Mocha Pro 2021, and if we play back this shot, we can see there's a woman smiling, her face and lips are moving around in different warpy ways, which the planar tracker would normally have a real issue tracking, because again, as we said, Mocha is really good at flat planar regions, not things that have organic distortion in them. So here I've got a pre rotoed shot already done, so this is just a single frame of roto. I haven't animated this yet, it's just to set us up so we don't have to draw it. So I've cut out the teeth here, because I don't care about the teeth, and I'm just caring about the warping shape around her face and lips. Now normally if we set perspective here, we would get some distortion, we'd get maybe a bit of the movement of the chin, they'd get a bit, a bit of skew and things like that, but overall we wouldn't get the curves or the distortion of the lips or the distortion of the cheeks as she closes her mouth. So down here we have a new feature called Mesh. So I'm going to turn that on and this activates a whole bunch of new parameters over here on the right. And we can see here that it's already trying to generate a mesh up here, but it's trying to find just the key features at the moment. So we need to give Mocha a little bit of a push. For the first part, I'm going to tell it to use the vertices on the spline so that we get a much broader mesh shape around the face. So if we generate that, we can see now we're getting a much more coherent mesh across the region that we've rotoed. I'm also going to turn on Adaptive Contrast, which just punches out the features a bit to help me find a bit more detail in the face. And this will help me track easier when we get to the tracking phase. We also, if we want to do something a bit more uniform because we want to sort of flatten this out in some way and then do paintwork, we've got up here a uniform mesh option which just generates a uniform mesh across the board. So it's not trying to find any particular features, it's just generating a nice flat mesh to use within the shot. And you can see here there's some overlap here. We could go up to the edit track mesh and delete these points if we wanted to, just like so. and over here, and over here. Or we could move them around using the edit track mesh point. So we'll turn that off for now. I'm gonna go back to the automatic mesh for now and generate that. So we have a set of features here that we can now track with. So the way the mesh tracker works is that it first of all does your standard planar track, but then it tries to subdivide the plane and work out the individual motion inside that plane. So we have a few options here. Here we have an option to use optical flow, and this is off by default because you only generally need to use optical flow in very unique situations. It's actually a lot slower to use optical flow for these kind of tracking techniques. So we found a better method and keep the optical flow off for now. So I'm gonna turn on auto smoothness. Auto smoothness just lets Mocha guess how much motion to track within the plane. If we had auto smoothness off, a smoothness of 50 would try and work out the general planar motion as well as the half the wobble within that plane. Closer to 100, we get to more rigid values, so we don't move as much within the plane and we try and follow the planar track as much as possible. 
and closer to zero says we ignore the planar motion a bit more and we try and get a bit more of the wobble that's happening in the shot. So you can consider this a bit like a starchiness or a rigidity factor. So 100 is very rigid, 1 is very non-rigid. So I'm going to turn on auto smoothness to let Mocha do the work. And then finally there's a little button down here called warp spline and that makes the mesh distort the spline as we're tracking so that we don't have to keyframe the mesh, uh, sorry keyframe the spline and keep that in check. So now that we've got all those set up we can start going ahead and tracking. I'm going to turn on the mat so we can see our spline a bit easier and I'm going to turn on my tracking cog and start tracking backwards. And we're going to speed up this track in a minute just so that you don't have to sit through it. But the, immediately what you can see is as it's tracking backwards, we're getting the motion of the plane using that standard planar shape. But we're also starting to get the distortion of the plane. You'll see here that as her mouth starts to close, it's going to follow the distortion of the lips around all these vertices points. And it's also going to distort the spline along with that mesh. So as I said before, we sped up that track. So let's just now play back the result. So here we can see how well that track has worked. We've got the spline and the mesh adjusting to the distortion of the face fairly well. The only place it's not covering is where new information is revealed such as when the turn of the lips turns down and reveals more of the lip, or when there's more of the chin that turns up from where it's revealed over here. But otherwise, it's a fairly solid track without any additional keyframes needed. So the implications for this technology are quite large. We're looking currently at doing distort and redistort workflow, so that you can do stabilized paint inside host programs and then redistort the paint back into the original shot. We're also going to be looking at warped inserts, so you can put inserted graphics directly into the shot, as well as doing exports for, say, the nulls on the vertices. So we could take this whole mesh, take each individual vertice, and then export it as a null cloud for the supported software. So these are all things that are up and coming. What I can show you immediately in this tech preview is actually the driving of this spline, however. So let's just go ahead and close and save. And inside After Effects, we can go ahead and either view the mat or apply the mat. And this is the same mat that we would normally see when we apply any roto mat inside Mocha to the host. But this one actually works directly from the driven spline. So if I go ahead and play back now, we're seeing this mat playback from Mocha Pro directly from the distorted spline that we did with the mesh track. So there's no additional keyframing here. It's all the tracking done from the mesh warper. We can also apply this track. So if I go back to the beginning here, let's just zoom out on this timeline. Just go back to full frame for a second. And I go down to create a masks. This will generate the same masks that we're used to inside After Effects, with the caveat, obviously, that any masks created on the inner spline would need to be changed. So we can see here that they're all working as expected. But we would just need to change that mask that's been created here to the subtract. So let's go to the masks here, smiley face here, choose subtract, and then we've got exactly the same mask as we just showed in the mat file. So I'm going to show you another couple of examples here of how this technology can be used, especially relating to this warp mat at the moment. So in this shot, we're doing a similar thing to the face where we've done a roto shape around a caterpillar here. And let's just have a look at that by itself first. So here we can see that the caterpillar is inching itself along. And there's a general concertina motion going on in the caterpillar that would be quite hard to do with a standard planar track. So the mesh warper does exactly the same thing here. So I'm going to turn back on my mesh here and we'll look at our spline shape. 
And if I go ahead and play this back, you can see that the concertina motion of the mesh track is following along with the caterpillar perfectly, and then it's also distorting that spline to match the same distortion in the mesh, which is amazing because it means that we don't have to do any of this subtle keyframing over time. We can let the mesh tracker handle it itself. So let's just go ahead and close and save. So we can see here I've already applied the mat. Let's just solo our layer for a second and you can see that. And once again, if I press play here, now I've got a bit of feather on this one just to make sure that we get a softness and we can see the applied mat going through there. So we look at this now as a general color change. I can turn on my CC toner here and just for getting a bit more speed, let's turn it down to quarter for a second. And we can see that going along nicely using the mat for that toner without any problems. So again, the warper is doing an amazing job of just warping that spline perfectly with the distortion mesh. So we're hoping to apply this to a lot more areas soon, but the initial tech preview, we can just show you the applied mat inside there, which is already pretty impressive. So just to show you the flexibility of this, here's a much bigger track that we've done. So we've got some eyes rotated out of the general face as well as the lips. I'm going to turn on that and we can see the mesh that we've generated here. It's ignoring the eyes because we've already cut them out. And if we play this back again, we can see all the subtle motion from around the face, the eyebrows, the cheeks being tracked perfectly using that mesh tracker because it's getting the planar motion first and then it's working out the distortion within the face regions. So putting it in perspective, in 2020 and earlier, we can only work with up to five points of tracking data on a single flat surface. With this new approach, we'll be able to work with a dense field of organic tracking data from tracking the warped subsurface motion. We're also looking at getting the mesh to be able to track around corners. So in this example, we've got a woman who's doing a push-up, and we can get the mesh tracker to follow the bend of the arm. So if I turn on the mesh tracker here, and again, we'll get the vertices on the spline and generate that. We'll get a bit more density into the mesh just so that we can get a bit more detail. And I'm going to turn on auto smoothness again and warp the spline. So if we start tracking this forward, we can start to see immediately that the mesh is actually distorting at right angles now and distorting the plane of the spline along with it. The only bit that we're not getting is the new information that's revealed as her bicep flexes here but we're getting the overall motion without having to actually reanimate any of these points over here. So this is a huge increase in productivity because we're no longer having to animate around the corners for these kind of organic motion. And you can see here how fast that was. This didn't need to be even be sped up. We could just track this while I was talking. So we're getting a much more progressive workflow from track to roto to the rest of the distortion. So when we can apply these new techniques to the other features, we'll have a really fun feature for everyone to use. Next up in this tech preview, I wanna talk a bit about a new overhaul we've made to one of Mocha's oldest features, the Adjust Track module. Adjust track, for those that aren't aware, is as it sounds. It's a module that adjusts the track after you finish tracking. And this is usually reserved for when you need to fix up a bit of drift or any problems with the track that couldn't be solved by the automated pass. So, for example, in this shot, we've got a track of a book here, and as we come through the shot, you can see that it starts to drop in the top corner here because of the sunlight kind of obscuring detail on the book and we can't have anything to track. Now we could retrack this and try and get more of the inner detail here, but this is exactly the kind of thing that adjust track was designed for. So in the old version of the adjust track, you would have to go ahead and set up your surface first and then go into the adjust track module to begin your adjusts because the adjust track module used the surface corners to be the reference points for your adjust. This was limiting in a number of ways. One, it meant that you only ever had up to four points to adjust with. Secondly, it meant that your surface was then locked into place and you couldn't adjust it again unless you created a new layer and linked back to the original track. 
So there were a huge amount of limitations and there was also just some general confusion about how to relate the surface back to the track. We've eliminated that somewhat by changing it to a new system where the surface only acts as a template for placing the points and then you can do what you like with them. So let's switch over to the transform tool and have a look at our new adjust track version 2. And I should point out obviously that this is not feature complete, this is a tech preview so there's some graphical changes that are going to happen here and we don't have all the features inside this module just yet. So the difference between adjust track version 2 and the old one is the level of control you have over the adjustment. Over here on the left in the transform types you can set the type of adjustment that you want to do. So if there's only a translation drift, we can stick translation here and set a point, and then we get an individual point to use as our adjustment. So I could move this to the top of this little Y here as my reference frame, set that, and then when I move forwards, if I drag that single point, I'm only doing XY translation of the surface. So let's just reset that. If I do scale and rotation and set my points, I get two reference points, one in the middle of my frame here and one over here in the top corner, because you need at least two points to do a scale or a rotation. So if I move forward here and I select one of my points, if I scale out, you can see it's scaling the adjustment. If I turn it around, we're getting a rotation adjustment. So you get to use that instead of a full perspective adjustment. So let's just reset that again. And the same goes for shear. If I set the points, I get a triangle, because three points is the minimum amount you need to do a skew adjustment. And finally, perspective. If we set the points, we get four points to do a four-point perspective adjustment. So let's just reset that, and we'll start doing this adjustment here. I'm going to move down to where we start to get a problem. So we're getting a little bit of a drift drop there. So I'm going to start about here, set my points, and set my reference frame. Now I'm going to move these points so that I can easily see them because these points down the bottom are useless to my surface. And as I do this you can see that it's not adjusting the surface and I'm able to keep moving around these reference points however I like and it doesn't affect my track yet. So let's just put it up here. So now we have our four points to work out our adjustment and we can start doing the adjustment down the line. So we have a preview window up here and we can select points individually. So let's select this top point here, or we can select it through the select buttons here, and move forward through the shot. So we can see here we've got a little bit of a drift already. So I'm just going to grab that top point and do an adjustment to make it fit. And as you see that, we can see we're getting a perspective adjustment based on all those four points. So I'm going to move it up to the top corner here. And just to be sure, I'm going to select through, and you can see here that this one's doing all right. This one's still sitting okay, and this one's still sitting okay. So we can quickly go through all our points and check. So we'll keep on going through our shot just to check. So let's come all the way down to the end. So this is where our big distortion problem is. So now I can go ahead and drag back up to my corner again. But you can see here that my distortion isn't quite correct yet, and this is where the other distortion points come in. So I'm going to select this one, and we can see that's moved quite far away from the Y. So I'll use my nudge tools because it's very hard to drag accurately in the window here. I'm just going to use my nudge tools to carefully push this back into the right position. About so. And this is a lot easier to use than trying to figure it out with the mouse. So let's go to the next point. So we can see again there that it's a little bit out. I'm going to move it to the left a little bit and up. And you can see how subtle that perspective motion is. Because perspective is a big distortion sometimes, even sub-pixel movements like this can make a big difference to the adjustment. And it's much easier to do it this way than the previous version. Let's go through and check all our corners. If we're unsure that our points are doing the job too, we can also look at our surface corners because they're still relevant. So I can check to see that my surface corner is still in the right spots. In this particular case, we can't see anything in our bottom corners, but we can at least check the top ones to make sure the surface is right 
if our reference points do not sit on the surface corners. So now we can go through and have a look at our adjustments and we can check our final result. So in this way we're adjusting the track under the surface and it's much easier to move and manipulate the points without having to mess up our original track. We can also then stop and use this surface again and adjust it and it doesn't affect the original adjustments that we've done. It's very, very easy to move and manipulate the surface while we're working in adjust track as opposed to the old method where the surface became the track and it became very, very difficult to manage. So these are just some of the adjustments that we're making to the adjust track module. It makes it a lot easier to use and a lot more flexible when you need to do specific adjustment types. So that was a quick look at some of the new features inside Mocha Pro 2021. There's a lot of smaller features in there that we didn't show you today and we've hinted at a couple of big features coming in the next major version. Now be aware that Mocha Pro 2021 is a free upgrade for those on a subscription or an upgrade and support contract. So if your contract or your subscription is coming near a close, we recommend getting up to date so that you're ready for the new features. Either way, we hope you enjoyed what we showed you today and we hope to see you again. Thanks very much and goodbye.